Hello again. In this video, I'm going to talk about the Royal Prerogative. The Royal Prerogative has been in the news in the last few years as a result of the United Kingdom's decision to leave the European Union. And at various points, the government has sought to use its powers under the Prerogative to aid its policy of leaving the European Union. And in two high profile cases, both brought by a businesswoman named Gina Miller, the Supreme Court has held that the prerogative powers do not extend as far as the government assumed that they did. We'll get to that, but first we must ask, what is the royal prerogative? A short answer would be to say that the term royal prerogative refers to the legal powers that government has, not by virtue of act of parliament, but as a matter of custom and tradition. These powers historically were exercisable by the monarch, and these days are said to be vested in the crown. But most of them are exercised by ministers acting in the name of Her Majesty's government, or else they are exercised by Her Majesty herself, acting on ministerial advice. A residual question is whether Her Majesty could, in certain circumstances, reject that advice. An example of the former powers exercised by ministers acting in the name of Her Majesty's government would be the conduct of diplomatic affairs. The power to make treaties with other nations is thus part of what we should, if we are being realistic about it, call the ministerial prerogative. But as you will know if you have watched my video on the legislative supremacy of Parliament, international law, and a treaty is a source of international law, only changes rights and obligations in domestic law once it has been incorporated by Act of Parliament. Another limitation on the prerogative to conduct diplomatic affairs used to take the form of a constitutional convention known as the Ponsonby Rule, under which treaties were for almost a century laid before Parliament before they were ratified. The convention was named after Arthur Ponsonby, Parliamentary Under Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs in Ramsay MacDonald's government. But nowadays, under Part 2 of the Constitutional Reform and Governance Act 2010, the Ponsonby Rule, or, or rather a variation of it, has been enacted into legislation. And under the 2010 Act, Parliament could, in fact, indefinitely delay the ratification of treaties although to do so it would have to continue to pass resolutions every 21 sitting days in the uh, Parliament. So we could say in this case that the prerogative has been for almost a century regulated by convention, the Ponsonby Rule, and is now limited by statute. But the power to make treaties remains one that exists under the prerogative and is exercisable by ministers acting in the name of Her Majesty's government. This highlights the general trend in recent decades to place ministerial prerogative on a legislative footing. The Constitutional Reform and Governance Act also places the regulation of the civil service on a statutory footing. Before 2010, the power to regulate the civil service also fell within the royal prerogative. As you will see when we look at the famous GCHQ case later in the module, that case held, amongst other things, that ex exercise of prerogative powers, not just its limits but the substance of how it was exercised, was amenable to judicial review. But I will leave that point without detailed discussion for the moment. We have already come across an example of a power that was formerly exercised by Her Majesty on ministerial advice when we discussed the Fixed Term Parliament Act 2011. Before the Act entered into force, the power to dissolve Parliament was a power of Her Majesty exercisable by convention at the request of the Prime Minister. There was a lingering question as to whether Her Majesty could refuse a request from her Prime Minister. And in fact, in 1950, Sir Alan Lascelles, who was Private Secretary to King George VI, wrote a pseudonymous letter to the Times in which he claimed that the King might refuse dissolution of if the existing parliament was vital, viable, and capable of doing its job. This power was never exercised, although it is said that Her Majesty dissuaded Tony Blair from calling an election in the spring of 2001 
when the foot and mouth epidemic was at its height. In any case, the matter was rendered moot by the 2011 Act. Section 6, subsection 1 of the Fixed Term Parliaments Act, however, states, This Act does not affect Her Majesty's power to prorogue Parliament. Prorogation is the temporary suspension of Parliament between sessions, in contrast with dissolution, which ends the Parliament and precedes a general election. Anyway, prorogation is a continuing example of a power exercisable by Her Majesty, but on ministerial advice. It was the exercise of this power of prorogation that was challenged in the case of the Crown on behalf of Miller and Prime Minister. Miller too, as it has become popularly known, and I shall talk about that in a minute or two. Another example of prerogative powers exercisable by Her Majesty on ministerial advice would be the power to grant most honours, such as knighthoods and peerages. These prerogatives, like the power to prorogue Parliament and the former power of dissolution, we can call personal prerogatives because they are exercised by the person of Her Majesty herself. Some of these personal prerogatives are personal in another sense, in that they are strictly within Her Majesty's absolute discretion. The granting of certain orders, like the Order of the Garter or the Order of the Thistle, are the personal gift of Her Majesty. And you may know that the Queen has personal rights over all the swans in this country, as well as any sturgeon caught in our waters. So if any of you go fishing and you catch a sturgeon on your line, be sure to make a gift of it to Her Majesty. But these personal rights of Her Majesty are interesting, but they are not particularly constitutionally significant. So when I talk about the personal prerogative, I'm talking about powers exercised by Her Majesty on the advice of ministers. At this point, it is worth noting one important kind of prerogative power, and that is the power of Her Majesty to make orders in council. Orders in council are a form of legislation, not made by Parliament, or even under powers conferred by Parliament and delegated legislation. They are made by authority of Her Majesty in council, that is, by the Privy Council, and as a matter of practice, they are drafted by civil servants. Before the Constitutional Reform and Governance Act 2010, rules governing the civil service would be made by orders in council. Today, the most important use of this legislative power of the Queen in council is to legislate for the colonies, strictly for conquered and ceded colonies, not settled colonies. You may have already come across an example of this, the Jamaican Constitution is properly cited as the Jamaica Constitution Order in Council 1962, and as its name implies, this is an order in council. This power continues to have constitutional significance. We tend to think of the British Empire as belonging to a bygone era, but in fact, the United Kingdom has a number of overseas dependent territories. A more recent and notorious example of the use of this power to legislate for the colonies is the British Indian Ocean Territory Constitution Order in Council 2004. The British Indian Ocean Territory is more commonly known as the Chagos Island. The largest island, known as Diego Garcia, has been leased from the United Kingdom to the United States for use as a military airbase. Now, the notoriety of the British Indian Ocean Territory Constitution Order comes from the fact that the order explicitly prohibits the Chagos Islanders from settling in what they regard as their homeland. It says, No person has the right of abode in the territory. And in a case called Banco No. 2, a majority of the House of Lords, consisting of Lord Hoffman, Lord Roger, and Lord Carswell, held that the Crown was perfectly entitled to do this. Banku, one of the expelled Chagos Islanders, had tried to argue that any legislation made by Her Majesty in Council must be made for the peace, order and good government of the territory, in other words, in the interests of the governed population. The majority held, however, that the Crown could legislate in the wider interests of the United Kingdom, including its defence interests, 
And if you're interested in finding out more about the Chagos Islands litigation, my friend and colleague at York University, T.T. Arvind, has written an article and a book chapter on the Chagos Islanders case. And I do recommend them to you as exceptional public law analyses. But for now, the important question that I want to draw your attention to is to what extent are the prerogative powers of the Crown reviewable by the court? For example, can orders in council be judicially reviewed like delegated legislation can? Or are they immune in the way that Acts of Parliament are? The short answer is that they can be judicially reviewed, but that the courts have taken quite a long time to get to this position, and they still show some reluctance in reviewing the substance of the exercise of prerogative powers. In the remainder of this lecture, I will briefly summarise the developments of recent case law in this area. At first sight, judicial review of prerogative acts would seem to offend against the principle of sovereign immunity, captured in the maxim that the king can do no wrong, but I mentioned in my earlier video, should constitutional conventions be codified. But the law has developed considerably over the course of the 20th century, and the position is now that prerogative powers are reviewable. The courts still show a great deal of deference to executive power here, and this is arguably justified. The prerogative is an important source of executive power in areas such as defence and foreign policy, areas in which we would expect judges to tread lightly. Anyway, it has for centuries been accepted that the courts could recognise prerogative powers where they existed. The flip side of that coin is that the courts could rule on whether a particular power existed or not, and whether a particular type of action was authorised by prerogative. A long-standing principle was that there was no prerogative power to alter existing rights under common law or statute. In the case of proclamations in 1610, Lord Cook famously declared that the king, by his proclamation, cannot change any part of the common law or statute law, or the customs of the realm. And over the course of the 20th century, it became understood that the prerogative was subject to three important legal limits. First, prerogative is limited by the principle spelled out in Attorney General in the Geysers Royal Hotel, under which, if Parliament has conferred powers on the executive to undertake a certain act, then that act can only be done under statutory powers, even if it was earlier covered by the prerogative. The creation of the statutory power places the royal prerogative in abeyance. Second, it is limited by the principle laid down in the Fire Brigade's Union case that the prerogative cannot be exercised so as to frustrate or preempt the will of Parliament. To do so would be an abuse of power. In this case, the government sought to use the prerogative power to implement a scheme for the compensation of victims of crime who had suffered what are called criminal injuries. Parliament had legislated for a different, more generous scheme, but that scheme had not yet been brought into force. The government intended to repeal the statutory scheme, but the House of Lords held that it had acted unlawfully by taking Parliament's consent to change the scheme for granted. And thirdly, the prerogative is limited by the principle laid down in Laker Airways and Department of Trade, which held that the prerogative power and municipal law are inextricably interwoven, even where statute does not directly abrogate or curb the prerogative. Prerogative powers cannot be exercised so as to take away rights of citizens recognised by statute, or be exercised so as to undermine the aims of a statute. These three limitations form part of the background to the two Miller cases that I mentioned at the outset of this mini-lecture. And the Crown on behalf of Miller and Secretary of State for exiting the European Union, a businesswoman named Gina Miller challenged the power, which was claimed by the government, to be able to serve notice of its intention to leave the European Union, as required by Article 50 of the Treaty on European Union. Now, the power to conduct diplomatic affairs, as you now know, falls within the prerogative. But on the other hand, as a result of the European Communities Act 1972, an act of the British Parliament, 
Many Britons, as well as citizens of the European Union member states living in the United Kingdom, enjoyed substantial legal rights. A majority of the Supreme Court held that the government did not have the power under the royal prerogative to leave the European Union. Parliament had, in passing the 1972 Act, provided for European law to become an independent and overriding source of domestic law. As such, only Parliament had the authority to take away rights arising from Britain's membership of the European Union. And the courts did not, contrary to what many claimed at the time, block Brexit, nor were they trying to. By their judgment, they ensured that the decision was taken by the body with the proper constitutional authority to do so, namely Parliament. Parliament subsequently passed the European Union Notification of Withdrawal Act 2017, explicitly conferring authority on the Prime Minister to give notice under Article 50. The then Prime Minister Theresa May subsequently gave notice, which she could now lawfully do. As I argued at the time in a blog post on the UK Constitutional Law Association blog, this whole litigation could have been avoided if the government had sought authority from Parliament ahead of time. Miller, too, also concerned powers arising under the prerogative. As negotiations over the United Kingdom's withdrawal from the European Union reached a climactic point, the Prime Minister advised Her Majesty to prorogue Parliament for five weeks. The case was challenged in both Scottish and English courts, in England by the same Gina Miller as brought the action in what we will now have to call Miller 1. The Supreme Court held, following the inner house of the Scottish Court of Session, that the Prime Minister's advice to Her Majesty was unlawful, and that as a result of the prorogation was null and void. It was as if Her Majesty's commissioners had delivered a blank piece of paper to Parliament, Note that the Supreme Court did not hold that Her Majesty herself had acted unlawfully. That would arguably have been a step too far given the principle of crown immunity, the king can do no wrong. The Supreme Court deftly avoided opening that particular can of worms. As Lady Hale and Lord Reed put it, it is not suggested in these appeals that Her Majesty was other than obliged by constitutional convention to accept that advice. In the circumstances, we express no view on that matter. In other words, the Supreme Court reserved its judgment on the question. The Supreme Court also stated that it was only concerned, as the case of proclamations had been concerned before it, to delineate the extent of the prerogative power. As the judgment puts it at paragraph 52, it is well established and is accepted by counsel for the Prime Minister but the courts can rule on the extent of prerogative powers. The standard which the Supreme Court was applying, it said, is a standard which determines the limits of the power, marking the boundary between the prerogative on the one hand and the operation of constitutional principles of the sovereignty of Parliament and responsible government on the other hand. In essence, the court was deliberately not taking a position on whether the Prime Minister's intention in seeking a prorogation was to prevent Parliament from scrutinising the government's handling of Brexit. All that mattered, from the point of view of the assessment of the boundaries of the prerogative power, was whether it had the effect of preventing Parliament from exercising its proper constitutional function. And since the court found that there was indeed such an effect, and since the Prime Minister had offered no objective justification for the prorogation, it was by this standard unlawful. I think there is an instructive comparison with the reasoning of the inner house of the Court of Session in Cherry, as the case is known in Scotland. There, the Court had found that, on the balance of the evidence before it, the true reason, as Lord Carloway, the Lord President, put it, for the prorogation could be inferred from the circumstances in which it was sought, as he says, in a clandestine manner during a period in which litigation concerning the prospect of prorogation occurring was extant. Put sharply, prorogation was being mooted specifically as a means to stymie any further legislation regulating Brexit. For my part, I would say that, while I agree with the decision of the Supreme Court, 
And I can understand why it's sought to avoid questioning the Prime Minister's motives. I am more sympathetic to the reasoning of the Court of Session. You could question its judgment on the balance of evidence if you like, but I like the straightforward way in which it tackled the issue head on. And it underscores the principle that power should not be abused, which is a core principle of administrative law, as you will see in a few weeks when we come to discuss the case of Pratfield. I hope you have enjoyed this mini-lecture. I hope you are now better informed about what the royal prerogative is, and about some instances of powers that fall under the royal prerogative. I also hope that you are beginning to understand some of the principles through which the courts can control the exercise of prerogative power. We will learn a bit more about this when we come to the administrative law part of this module in a few weeks' time. For now, I will see you in the next video. Goodbye.